Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this 43rd Legislative District Virtual Town Hall. Today, you'll hear from Senator Jamie Peterson, Representative Nicole Macri, and Representative Frank Chop. Our goal today is to provide, to provide you an update on this year's legislative session and to respond to your questions and concerns about state government and issues before the legislature. Some of today's questions were submitted in advance through the survey we sent out through e-newsletters and on Facebook. And throughout the hour, please share your questions in the comment section wherever you're watching, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. We're gonna try to get through as many topics and as many questions as we can today. So let's get things started with some introductions. Senator Peter Peterson, can you kick us off? Sure, thanks very much, Curtis. Uh, my name is Jamie Peterson. I'm the state senator for the 43rd district and am happy to be with you all here today. Although I do have to say, I really hoped that we would be back in person this year. Um, let's hope that next year we'll be able to do the town hall in person. I wanted to highlight just a couple of things that have happened so far in the state Senate. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, one is that I've been working on a bill with Seattle Subway uh, for the last few months um, that will allow the city of Seattle and any other uh, sub area within the Sound Transit area to come up with an additional package of improvements for the light rail and transit system, uh, and then the money to pay for it, put that in front of the voters, and then start building those enhancements because I think uh, we can all agree that the uh, light rail is great, but needs to be built out faster and uh, that it has tremendous promise for us, but uh, that that's going to be realized only if it can be built out uh, so that it has even better service than it already has. Uh, the other piece of legislation that I wanted to highlight is something that I've been working on for many years and last year was uh, happy to be able to get out of the Senate Law and Justice Committee. And then this year uh, was especially pleased to have come out of the uh, out of the Senate uh, with a strong 28 to 21 vote. And that's uh, a ban on high capacity magazines. We know that the uh, whether a state allows the sale of high capacity magazines is one of the strongest uh, factors that correlates with uh, the prevalence of mass shootings uh, in that state. And so I'm really happy that we were able to make that step and I'm uh, keeping my fingers crossed that uh, my colleagues over in the house are gonna be able to get that one across the finish line this year. So uh, look forward to the look forward to the questions. I, I guess I just finally wanna say that it is a huge privilege 
to serve uh, with both Representative Macri and Representative Chop. It still feels a little weird to say Representative Chop, uh, but but they are fantastic advocates for our district um, and for all of the folks who live here. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to them. And I don't. I think Nicole, probably you're going to have to go first because Frank always likes to go last. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie, and it's great to be here. And I'm really sorry that I actually can't see the audience. It makes it really um, a lot less, I think, enjoyable to have this connection with folks, but really glad that we are able to at least see the questions and know that many people are watching today. And I too am hopeful that uh, next time we can be in person. I, I thought we would be there by now, but I think we all um, have learned to live with a lot of uncertainty and um, changing dynamics over the last couple of years. So I'm Nicole Macri, and I have served um, the 43rd Legislative District since 2017. Um, and I, in the last uh, couple of years, have been serving as a vice chair of the House Appropriations Committee and want to highlight um, a few different book policies we've been working on in the House, as well as um, talk a little bit about the budget. Um, we'll start to see um, the Senate and House uh, operating budgets uh, coming out this week and some action um, turning, turning to our operating budgets. Um, on the policy front, uh, we have had a very um, lively first half of session. This year, um, I'll say it's come with a lot of big successes and, and definitely some disappointments for me and some policy areas that I thought we would make more progress on, um, but we will continue to push forward on. Um, on the climate action front, um, I was really pleased to see us get um, uh, the Clean Buildings Bill 1770 out of the House and over to the Senate. Um, as well as um, House Bill 1099, which is um, looking at climate-related um, issues as we, as cities and counties implement the Growth Management Act. Um, having done a lot of work myself in the area of housing, including building a lot of housing for people who are low-income and homeless, um, we know that um, energy efficiency in the built environment is really important. So I'm glad to see us making, making progress um, on that front. Um, I'm really glad the Senate passed over uh, the high capacity magazines bill to the House and look forward to that. We passed over to the Senate um, a couple of um, gun safety bills that I am really glad we got over. One is um, banning ghost guns that Representative Liz Berry from just over in the 36, um, did tremendous work on. And another what is on um, banning <clears throat> guns in certain, in certain locations, um, including places like school board meetings. Um, and as we've seen just more and more um, discord in the public dialogue, particularly around uh, the pandemic, these safety measures are really, really important. As usual, these bills were highly contentious on the floor with Republicans putting up um, dozens of amendments against them, um, but they are so important. So I'm glad that we're making progress um, on that front. Um, I, I'm looking at my notes. Oh, a couple other ones I do wanna talk about. Um, we in the House passed a bill um, on social emotional learning and really making sure that students in um, our public schools can have um, access to nurses and counselors and psychologists. Alicia Rule, who is a member from up in Whatcom County and um, who works, specializes in children's mental health herself, um, brought forward that bill. Um, and we also um, passed a bill to um, enhance and set a new strategic plan on children's behavioral health. So uh, all of that, I think, is vitally important as we continue to hear more and more about the struggles that um, kids, you know, students and families um, continue to navigate throughout the pandemic. Um, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, bills that that we've been working on to uh, support working people in our state, um, in particular, um, House Bill 1868, which is a bill to 
um, bring more protections to healthcare workers, particularly those working in hospital settings. Um, that um, staffing bill is really important. We're hearing about the challenges the pandemic's presenting um, in terms of workplace conditions. And it is, I think, time um, for us to ensure some safeguards for our hospital workers. They've done tremendous work um, throughout the pandemic and um, the state needs to be there for them. And similarly, we you may have heard we the House um, had a very long, maybe longest in history debate on um, protecting workers um, who, who have um, muscular skeletal injuries. This is from doing repetitive work. So these are, um, this is a particularly an important bill for people who have, um, who are in usually lower paid um, or, or more um, dangerous physical labor positions. And so I was really glad we stuck it out on that bill and passed it. Um, there is definitely an intersection between incre increase in mus musculoskeletal injuries at work and our growing opioid crisis over the last decade. And so um, for me, that was an issue, not just of worker protection, but of public health as well. Um, there's many more bills. As I said, I've been working a lot on the operating budget, um, and I am glad to take questions on that. I'll say that the operating um, budget that we'll see from both the Senate and the House, um, I am um, very optimistic about, in part because it's, it's going to be, these budgets are going to be built on top of what was a historic biannual budget um, that we um, passed and the, and the governor signed last year, making investments um, in the resiliency um, of people across Washington. So we really focused on the basics in the last budget and we're gonna build upon that. So food, shelter, health, direct cash in the form of rent assistance, utility assistance, immigrant relief, um, small business uh, relief, um, climate action. So we took great steps last year and we'll continue to do that as we see the supplemental budgets um, come out. And I look forward to the conversation coming up and I'll turn over to you, Frank. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. I uh, appreciate this opportunity very much. Uh, welcome to everybody who's tuning in. It is a great uh, working relationship. We have the three of us uh, working on all sorts of issues, including everything that Nicole said, plus uh, what Jamie said. We're uh, in agreement on those issues uh, for sure. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd just like to focus in on uh, a particular issue in terms of housing and homelessness. Um, Nicole and I, in particular, are working very hard on that. Uh, and as she said, there will be a historic level of funding in the capital budget uh, for uh, affordable housing uh, through that state housing trust fund, plus a new program, a uh, new dynamic to address the issue of uh, homelessness. And um, I'm supposed to speak up more. That's sort of funny. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Um, <laughs> um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. The uh, issue I've been focusing on in particular, in addition to the things that Nicole and Jamie said, was uh, trying to figure out a new dynamic in terms of dealing with homelessness. Uh, when you uh, have a situation statewide where the people of the state believe strongly that we should have uh, as a top priority for this legislative session, housing and homelessness, I went to work with uh, Nicole and many others, uh, a lot of stakeholders, to come up with a new dynamic, which I've called Apple Health and Home. The key is to link up health care and housing, uh, particularly the, for those who are on the streets and are uh, facing chronic homelessness. So I've asked the question, well, why are people chronically homeless? And uh, the issue is uh, pretty clear. Over 70% are there because of their medical condition, their mental illness or substance use disorder or severe uh, physical disability. So we have uh, put together a proposal, Apple Health and Home, House Bill 1866, that I got out of the House uh, 96 to two. It wasn't quite unanimous, but damn close. Uh, and what it does is it sets up a process for people who are on Medicaid, the Apple Health Program, if they are homeless due to their medical condition, then they should have a home. Now, I believe, uh, as many of you probably are tuning in, believe that housing is a fundamental human need and a fundamental human right. This is a way to go forward on this thing, to focus in the people that need the help the most. Those who are suffering and dying on the street. And so we're uh, very pleased with this uh, progress. Uh, there will be money in the capital budget as well as the operating budget to, to carry that out. In addition to th those issues in terms of homelessness, uh, I've also been very pleased to see the progress we've made in terms of workforce housing 
uh, and other related community services. So two projects you might want to see in the district here, if you get out at all, up at Roosevelt, uh, I played a leading role in getting the housing above the light rail station, 270 units of housing, plus the early learning center run by El Centro de Raza. It's nearly done, so I urge you to come to the open house and they have it. And another one is at Madison and Boylston, a first hill. It's a transferring development housing going up 17 story for 370 units of housing, including 120 units reserved for homeless seniors. Uh, so I, I think these are the kinds of tangible efforts we can do that affect not only people statewide, but help people uh, in our own district. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. And a reminder to folks watching at home, this is a live virtual town hall with your 40, 43rd legislative district uh, representatives and senators. So please ask us questions in the comments and we're gonna try to get to as many of them as we can today. And let's start out with a question from Charles who sent us his question through the survey that we sent out to constituents. Charles asks, what are you doing to modify Washington's long-term care law? Charles says that one of the reasons he thinks it's a bad deal for Washingtonians is because of things like not being able to use it in another state. So you, can you tell us about this program and what changes um, you're going to make to it this year? I'm glad to take that one. Um, Frank and I actually have been working uh, together quite closely on the reforms to the Washington Cares program, which, you know, I do want to uh, say the underlying program um, will be an in incredible um, benefit for Washingtonians um, in the sense that it will um, first and foremost really, I think, bring a tremendous opportunity for seniors to continue to stay in their homes for as long as possible. Um, we know that most folks need long-term care. Most of us have not saved money um, to provide for our own long-term care. And many of us um, are in uh, situations where we must uh, take care um, of our um, family members, often parents, as they get to aging. I was just saying, most of us have this idea that people live a long life and they die suddenly. And unfortunately for, for most people, that is not the case and they will need some kind of care. So um, the Walk Cares program is a forward looking program in establishing um, a way for Washingtonians to get the support that they need and really keep people out of bankruptcy and keep them in their own homes for as long as possible. Um, it uh, was and continues to be in need of some reforms. And so um, the, led, the governor has already signed into law um, reforms that uh, the House and Senate work together on, um, including uh, ensuring um, that those um, folks who are later in their careers who will be paying in and would, won't, would not have reached the original vesting period, which was a 10 year period, um, can get prorated benefits um, for the dollars that they put into the program. And then we added um, some exemptions to the program for folks who are incredibly unlikely to be able to draw down benefits, people who are going to only be uh, working in Washington for a very short amount of time, um, like um, non-immigrant visa holders, um, people who currently live outside of Washington, but work in Washington, like residents of Oregon or Idaho, um, and um, for military spouses who relocate to Washington for a short period of time as their spouse is serving the United States military. Um, but Charles brings up a good point that there's more work to do on that, and we will see um, language in, the, in our budgets to direct um, the Washington CARES program to look into ways we can make benefits more portable. It's, we actually, um, Frank and I um, worked on this issue quite a bit over the last year and what we learned in lurking, working with the state agencies and with stakeholders is that it's pretty complicated um, to create a portability of the benefit, um, but the legislature is uh, directing the executive branch to figure it out because we do think that is essential and and the point is true some people will feel they can't retire in washington others will will choose to move closer uh, to family in their later years and so it is an issue 
um, that we think needs to be worked on. Now, the, in, the initial benefits um, won't start to roll out on, on the plan for several years. And so while this is an issue that needs to be addressed, we think it's worthwhile to take the time and put the work in to do it well. I, I could add, if you don't mind, uh, the fact that uh, we listen to people from around the state who had legitimate concerns about Washington CARES program. We listened and we took several actions, uh, including delaying the program so we could make sure we implement it in a proper way and also do several key reforms, as uh, Nicole referred to. But we kept in mind that this fundamental approach is really a way of expanding Social Security, which is a very popular program. But when it got started, it had some you know, things to improve and uh, uh, implement over the years, but fundamentally we believe in social security for all who need it. All right, let's stick with another question from the survey. Um, actually, a few questions came in on the survey about police reform um, and the status of legislation around that, especially House Bill 2037. Camille, Vince, and Diane all had questions about that. So can you tell us what's the status of that bill and um, any possible modifications we could see to the um, the police accountability reform legislation that passed last year. Yeah, so I'm happy to take the lead on this set of questions. So obviously in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and uh, the murder of a whole series of um, black and brown people, uh, we, uh, spent a lot of time thinking about, and then a lot of our effort in the 2021 session, passing a series of police reform bills, uh, depending on how you count, somewhere between 12 and 15 of those bills. And the vast majority of that legislation, including uh, the bill about reform of the Criminal Justice Training Commission uh, that I prime sponsored, have gone into effect without any problems at all, really no complaints from stakeholders, from the police. Um, there are two bills that we passed last year, one about uh, police tactics and one about use of force that have been the focus of uh, complaints by the, by the police and a sustained campaign to try to reverse some of the reforms. Now, some of the things that they have raised are issues that we didn't intend. I think, you know, it's could be fair or could be unfair to say um, uh, that there are defects in the original law. For example, we never intended to say that the police could not use force to help put someone into involuntary treatment. So uh, the House has already passed and there is a bill right now in the Senate Law and Justice Committee that I feel quite confident is going to make it to the governor's desk that says that in a set of specific areas uh, around behavioral health and child welfare, uh, community caretaking, that police can use reasonable force. Uh, and so we will make those corrections. Um, there's another question that came up around the tactics bill and its general prohibition on the use of military equipment uh, about the use of uh, beanbag rounds, less lethal alternatives. Um, that police might be able to use. And we also did not intend uh, to prohibit the police from using less lethal alternatives. So the House has already passed again, and this, uh, there is a bill before the Senate Law and Justice Committee that I feel quite confident uh, will make it to the governor's desk. Um, there are some other issues that I feel quite confident are we're not going to reverse our reforms on. So for example, um, there were proposals both in the House and the Senate um, to change the law back and allow the police to use uh, vehicular pursuits. Um, and, uh, you know, what we sometimes call hot pursuits or car, police car chases, which are really dangerous for the police. They're dangerous for the suspects and they're dangerous for innocent bystanders. They're just not necessary uh, in almost all cases. So I don't think that it's likely that any of those changes will get to the governor's desk. Then uh, in between those ends of the spectrum, there's a question about um, when the, how the police can stop people and use force uh, when there are 
what are called investigative detentions or Terry stops. And uh, the legislature did not last year intend to prohibit the use of Terry stops, but um, some questions have come up about that. So there were bills in both the House and the Senate uh, that would clarify that. And uh, House Bill 2037 is probably the vehicle that if we make some changes in that area would be the vehicle for that. Now that bill passed out in out of the House um, with language that I think the Coalition for Police Accountability, those are the families and their allies, the ACLU and others, um, we're not comfortable with. And so we are in the process of uh, revising that bill in the um, in the Senate Law and Justice Committee. And I, I don't know the answer. I think the bill will come out of the committee with language that I think we can be happy with and that the ACLU and the coalition uh, will be comfortable with. Uh, if, it, if we can't get there, then I don't think the bill is going to come up for a vote. Um, so that's in a nutshell, the status of 2037. And I, I really appreciate the, the deep engagement, continued engagement uh, on these issues from our constituents. I have heard from many of you about this and, and appreciate the support and encouragement. Yeah, I'll just add to that, um, that there, the engagement has been incredibly helpful from my perspective as well. Um, and this is an area I think that all three of us um, have been taking um, very seriously. Um, Frank and I both uh, voted against uh, 2037, although there are some really helpful clarifying um, things in that bill, uh, particularly around defining fiscal force, which was, has been a challenge over the last year of not having a statutory definition of fiscal force, but uh, Jamie's honed in on the issue of concern um, that, that families um, of people who have been killed by police um, raised with me. I had many emotional conversations with impacted families about this and in, in just also in my work in behavioral health with highly vulnerable people, many of whom I've known personally to have very bad interactions with police, um, I felt the bill just went went too far. So I'm glad to hear that Senate Law and Justice is doing some continued work in that area. Um, and I'll say it's 1735, which is the bill to clarify um, officers' role in assisting in behavioral health crises is one that I worked really closely with the sponsors on um, and I think will be incredibly helpful. I've heard from many people in the district um, about um, incidents that have come up here in Seattle where people have been in behavioral health crisis um, and the um, police accountability bills that we passed last year have been cited as reasons for, for officers not intervening in ways that they had been um, doing in the past in ways that were helpful. So um, I, I think some of the clarifications in the law will be helpful um, and um, we'll see what happens with uh, 2037. All right, thank you. Let's go to a question from Facebook and I'll um, pitch another reminder to everybody. This is a live uh, virtual town hall with your 43rd uh, district legislators. So please send us questions in the comment section, whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter, and we're gonna take as many as we can. So let's go to our first question from Facebook. This comes from Joanna. Joanna is asking, are we gonna see a transportation revenue package? Um, I know that has been um, introduced already and it has passed, um, at least one of the pieces of legislation attached to it has passed the Senate already. Um, so perhaps we can hear from the lawmakers about what's in it for the state of Washington, what's in it for Seattle in the 43rd district, and just your thoughts about what's gonna get it across the finish line this year. I could start since we started. Uh, the Senate has already passed the transportation package. We passed it last Tuesday. Uh, at least the revenue part of it, we're expecting this coming Friday to pass the um, the projects and the details that go about the spending side of the package. Um, but it is going to be the greenest transportation package in the history of the state with huge investments in active transportation, bike and pedestrian uh, infrastructure and in transit, uh, including free transit for all youth 
in the state, which is a huge step forward uh, for us. Um, it also, a little bit closer to home in terms of projects, is going to include money to balance the books on the 520 project and make sure that the neighborhoods in our district, uh, Roanoke and Montlake, uh, in particular, get all of the mitigation that they've been promised uh, through the course of the project and that we make those uh, bike connections uh, so that folks can use their bicycles to get around. So uh, I am I am really excited about the transportation package. There are still things that we need to be uh, working on. Oh, and there's also going to be money for continued progress on the idea of uh, building a lid over I-5 in downtown Seattle, which uh, I think would be a huge benefit for uh, the state generally, and in particular for the 43rd. Uh, so I'm excited to see that happen. Um, the passage of the Climate Commitment Act last year really opened up the dollars, the flexible dollars that don't have to be spent on road expansion like the gas tax, uh, so that we can uh, make make that package happen this year. I could add uh, my uh, two cents worth. Yes, I absolutely do believe that the uh, transportation will pass both houses. There will be some adjustments made along the way. A big uh, priority for us, us is to make sure that we invest in preservation and maintenance of our current structure rather than build new highway capacity. That's an incredibly important thing. In years past, I've been part of groups that have sued the state of Washington over the expansion of Interstate 90 and uh, the uh, Arboretum, the uh, what was called the uh, R.H. Thompson Expressway that was going to wipe out the Arboretum. So we have, have had some successes in the past, but this one, more than any uh, uh, transportation package in the past, has really focused in on preservation and maintenance and the transit investments, which is incredibly important, uh, as Jamie just described. And so I think it's going in the right direction. We'll see the details, but yes, there will be a transportation package. And, I, and I'll just add, finally, that the three of us uh, collaborated very successfully when the package was getting uh, finalized <laughs> to make sure that there's not going to be an expansion uh, by building a second Montlake Bascule Bridge, uh, which would have really harmed the neighborhood and is completely an unnecessary expansion of road capacity in an area that's now well served by transit. Here, here. All right, Margie is watching on YouTube and she has a question. Um, on, on the same topic. And this one might be a question more about how you're gonna interact with your federal partners related to the transportation package. But Margie is concerned that um, an investment in um, high-speed rail in the transportation package could be a bit harmful for the climate and perhaps more investment in Amtrak would be a better use of dollars and um, better for the environment. Can you speak about that? Well, I could start maybe by saying that uh, for uh, many months, I've uh, brought together uh, constituents in the 43rd district. I, I call them my, my climate crew and uh, and it involving uh, quite a number of people in, in the district uh, focusing on climate. But part of that, obviously, is the transportation package. They have raised to me the concern about uh, the high speed, the ultra high speed rail in terms of whether it's worth the investment and how long it would take. and look what happened in California, that kind of thing. And they'd much prefer money being put into Amtrak investments. So I'm going to be working with our transportation chair to try to push that ethic uh, because we need to improve what we already have. Uh, but there's a lot of folks who believe in that ultra high speed. It's just a question of whether it's feasible and how costly it will be compared to all the other things we need to fund. All right, looks like we've started a bit of a dialogue on the social media feeds about this issue. So let's take one more question from Stan, who's watching on YouTube before we switch gears to a different topic. Stan um, asks, can you say a bit more about the fact that there will not be a second Montlake Bridge? Yeah, so uh, many years ago, I think probably Frank 2009, uh, Washdot started saying that because we weren't building the Pacific interchange that was going to take uh, cars from 520 over to the north side of the Montlake Cut, they started including a uh, money for a second bascule bridge over the Montlake Cut, just to the east of the existing bascule bridge. And uh, we've been in many meetings and have been fighting that idea for the last 12 or 13 years. Um, the city council has at various points passed resolutions opposing it, and we've heard loud and clear from the neighbors who live in Montlake that they have no interest in a widening of the road and an addition of the bridge. And probably most importantly, we've heard from traffic engineers that there's 
zero, zero benefit in adding a bridge because the congestion through there is caused by the fact that the bridge has to go up, not by a lack of lanes. So um, when we found out this year that the uh, 520 project was roughly $600 million out of balance um, and needing additional resources, I started right away saying, well, how much of that is the second vascular bridge that's still on the books? And it turns out that more than $200 million of that shortfall is because of that second vascular bridge. So I said, well, I can help you solve one third of the problem right there. Okay. And so uh, Nicole and Frank and I have been working on that. And um, although that was in an early draft of uh, the house package, the um, Nicole and Frank were able to advocate well, and we did from the Senate side as well. And as a result, that is taken out of the taken out of the package and uh, pushed out. So uh, I think we are pretty confident that that is not going to be funded. All right, let's go to housing now. We've received quite a few questions from constituents about the role that housing and density place or uh, have in confronting the housing crisis. We heard from Joe, Judy, and IJ expressing concerns about preserving neighborhood character and livability. Um, we've received questions about the zoning bills that were introduced this session. Um, and, you know, specifically, Karina is asking what's next for advocating for rezoning in cities like Seattle? And how can constituents get involved about learning about the legislation? And um, how can they take action to help you? Um, I'm glad to kick off that one and have uh, some conversation. And so um, we worked quite a bit on a zoning reform bill, House Bill 1782, that would uh, have enacted um, broad, low-level density across um, many cities and towns in Washington state um, and having slightly different requirements for, for cities over 10 thousand and um, cities over 20,000 and then larger cities like like Seattle. Um, and the, the concept of a broad low level increase in density by um, replacing in what have traditionally been single family zones, the ability to build duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, fourplexes um, or cottages, for example, um, is a way, if you do it broadly, um, can um, increase the kind of housing options that we know that middle income people need. So that doesn't let government off the hook from really continuing to make significant investments like the ones that Frank talked about to ensure that the lowest income people, people who are living homeless, um, have access to housing that is affordable. Um, but what we've seen over the last decade or so is that um, more and more and more um, middle-income people are being pushed out of communities further and further away from employment centers, further away um, from um, higher education um, centers like the University of Washington because the cost of housing has just gotten exorbitantly high. And people have asked me, well, we've seen upzoning happen in Seattle and the cost of housing has continued to increase. What we've done in Seattle is pretty targeted um, up zones, um, often going from a lower level to, to really to multifamily, so apartment building um, zones, and that can certainly cause displacement and gentrification. Um, but the other thing we've seen is that cities have unevenly worked on um, zoning reform, and so as housing, the housing crisis has become less of an urban issue, definitely more of a regional issue in, in the Puget Sound, and now even a statewide issue, as I'm hearing more and more people saying that not only are they leaving Seattle, but they're leaving Western Washington to move to Eastern Washington, um, and we're seeing the housing costs go up incredibly in Eastern Washington. In Spokane, rents went up 23% in the last year. Um, this idea of a statewide low-level up zone um, took hold. Now, um, there are many considerations um, to be um, brought forth in such a conversation. And I think I heard some um, talked about in terms of tree canopy and neighborhood and so neighborhood character. And I think 
part of what we need to continue to do as we have these zoning conversations is to figure out like what is the baseline and where is the right spot for local communities um, to have some say at the kind of micro level about what works in their communities. But I will say, you know, from my perspective, um, leaving zoning policy solely and exclusively to local communities has been part of the failure um, that we have had as a state um, in ensuring enough access to housing that is affordable for more and more people in our state. All right, thank you. And I'm noticing that we're having more and more people join us as our time continues here in this live virtual town hall with Senator Jamie Peterson, Representative Nicole Macri, and Representative Frank Chop. So to everyone who has joined us in the last few minutes, please send us your questions in the comment section wherever you're watching, and we're going to try to take as many as we can. And now let's turn to public safety. We talked a little bit about police accountability. Now let's turn to public safety. Nathan and Ellen um, both sent us questions in the survey, I believe. I know Ellen sent us the question in the survey. I think Nathan did too. They're both concerned about crime and retail theft. Can you speak to uh, what the legislature is doing to address these issues? Did you? Ahead, Jamie. Well, I'll just say from the budget perspective, like what one thing that we are doing is the more we can do to ensure the sort of ecosystem of small businesses are vibrant and we're bringing people um, back into the business districts of our communities, um, the better off we, I think we all will be. We've seen um, issues around. Um, you know, low level um, crimes. We're hearing more and more anecdotally about that um, and um, clearly an intersection with um, the absence of people and, the, and the, the absence of interaction in the brick and mortar location. So um, we made significant investments last year to um, support small businesses. And I, and I think we'll see that again um, in th this year's budget proposals as well. If I could add to that, uh, both Nicole and I, and I know Jamie supports this as well, is that we need to provide a hell of a lot more housing for folks who are homeless. Uh, they usually bear the brunt of being blamed for this kind of uh, issue, and it's a serious issue, but the answer has to be with providing decent housing for people who are on the street, whether they're in the tents or in the gutter or in the parks or whatever, and that's why we've pushed a number of proposals and successfully so in terms of investments. The best way to invest in Public safety is to invest in our people through things like housing and healthcare and education. So we will continue that and also still want to work in partnership with other levels of government to address the broader issue. And I'll just say finally that um, while we have been watching these trends, we have not um, we've not just sat on our hands. We the Senate passed um, Senate Bill 5781, which has to do with organized retail theft. Um, situations where there's sort of a coordinated attempt uh, for multiple people to overwhelm uh, the security at retail stores. And um, so uh, we we passed that 46 to 3 last week, and uh, that is currently in the House Public Safety Committee. All right. We heard a little bit from you in your introductory remarks about um, climate and the environment, but let's hone in on that a little bit more with this question from Dean, who um, asks, who he says, global warming is an existential threat to our children and grandchildren. What actions can we expect to see from our legislators to avert the climate catastrophe? Well, maybe I could start here, um, is that we did a lot over the last a few years, uh, once we got a uh, progressive majority in the state Senate, by the way, thanks Jamie for doing all that work uh, to join the house uh, progressive majority. Uh, and one of the key things we did was to uh, pass a bill in 2019, which is 100% clean electricity, where the electricity being generated is all clean and non-carbon. Uh, in addition, uh, Nicole's been a great leader on electric cars, and I've been uh, her uh, co-sponsor on many of the things that she's proposed in order to transition our transportation system away from you know gas guzzling cars and SUVs into electric vehicles and we're making progress on that I think that's the key part in the future because over 50 percent of the climate emissions evidently are from the coming out the tailpipes and so we have to address that head-on uh, through a combination of efforts 
And then uh, Nicole had mentioned the House bill about energy code 1770. The Senate also passed a uh, bill uh, 5722, which is another clean buildings bill. After vehicle emissions, uh, the emissions from our built environment from buildings uh, are the next biggest contributor in our state uh, to carbon pollution. And so uh, the 5722 will dramatically increase the number of buildings that are uh, subject to those kinds of controls and help us to transition in coordination with the bill that Frank mentioned uh, about clean electricity toward a world in which our buildings are not uh, polluters, but can actually be carbon capturers. Um, so, and then I'll just say, finally, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but last year's passage of the Climate Commitment Act uh, which is now in the process of rulemaking and being implemented um, is going to put us on a path for a pretty dramatic and nation leading uh, reduction in carbon emissions. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue to be an example uh, for other states and other countries about how to do this properly. Um, I just want to add a couple of slower profile things. So um, I have done a lot of work, as Frank said, on the um, zero emission vehicle front. It's just one one piece of the puzzle as you're hearing, but an important one. And in the last year, I've been working really closely with the governor's staff on implementing an executive order to move all of our state vehicles to 100% zero emission um, by 2035. So that's not starting to purchase um, zero emission vehicles, but by 2035 to see all of our state um, owned vehicles as zero emission. Um, so we'll, we have um, resources in the budget to aid in that transition. Um, and similarly, the setting out a goal that's even more ambitious than California's to really ensure that new um, vehicles registered in the state of Washington are all zero emission is something I've been working on for a long time. It's an um, element that's included in the transportation package, um, not only setting out the target date, but requiring state agencies to do a scoping plan to ensure that we can move the um, market and ensure consumers um, are well positioned for that transition in 2030. Um, and so those are a few lower profile things, but I think essential um, to, to, to get us there. Okay, thank you. Well, since we heard from Representative Macri about electric vehicles, let's stick on that same topic with a question from Sue that we got in the survey. Sue says she's all for renewable energy and electric vehicles, but is there a plan for all the trash that will be generated from switching from um, gas powered cars to electric vehicles? Um, and also what can be done to help low income folks afford them? I can, I can take the second part of that question uh, where I'm a little I'm a little bit more knowledgeable. I'll say that um, in terms of the um, uh, recycling of um, of batteries, including batteries in electric cars, we did have a lot of robust um, policy consideration in the in the house around that, and I think um, more work will be done in that area. Uh, Representative Harris Talley from the um, 37th District um, did tremendous work in bringing together industry and um, and environmentalists around issues around the battery um, um, transition. But the, we have been having a lot of conversations about how not only can we bring new vehicles, but how we can switch out sort of gas engines to electric engines. This is you know, way above my knowledge level, but apparently there is work happening in, in, um, in our um, community colleges programs around how we do those kinds of transitions. The governor's budget included a pretty significant electric vehicle rebate program um, that would move us away from um, greenhouse gas, um, uh, ICE vehicles and um, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles more rapidly. Um, but I think we'll see a uh, variation on the governor's proposal coming both from the House and the Senate. The governor's proposal really focused uh, a lot on higher income families and higher MSRP 
vehicles. Um, and um, at least in the house, we've been really talking about a more equitable approach and looking at the neighborhoods and communities that are most impacted um, by gasoline emissions and how do we, which are often lower income um, areas of the state and how do we really help folks who otherwise would not um, have the resource or be inclined to transition to electric vehicles when they make that choice to purchase their next vehicle for it to be electric. Um, and so we'll see significant uh, resource, I think, in the operating budgets ar around um, supporting middle and lower income uh, families and making those choices for zero emission vehicles. poor and unsafe staffing conditions. Um, so now that the bill's in the Senate, maybe we can hear a little bit about uh, the plan to get it out of there into the governor's desk. And Curtis, we couldn't, I don't, we couldn't hear the beginning of the question. I think you might've been muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, I'll just start all over. So we uh, we heard from the three of you in your introductory remarks about the healthcare state safe staffing bill. Uh, we also got a question from Whitney about it. Whitney says she is a nurse herself and moved out of the state because of the condi conditions she faced. Um, so can you speak about uh, the bill's prospects in the Senate and whether it may get to the governor's desk this year? Um, so I'm a, I'm a co-sponsor of Senate Bill 5751, which is the Senate companion bill to 1868. Uh, and I, I do think that given the crisis that we have in healthcare uh, with the ongoing pandemic, the burnout uh, among healthcare workers and nurses in particular, um, and the, the um, information that we have about the likelihood that there could be a significant wave of retirements or people leaving healthcare professions, we need to take uh, action to try to help address the most significant concerns that we've heard about their work conditions, which are forced overtime and inadequate staffing. Uh, those are really complex problems, but, um, but I think that the, uh, the bill, HB 1868, is a, a really strong attempt to try to address the concerns that we've heard from those frontline workers um, and that we have an obligation to support it. Now, I don't, uh, I, the bill right now is in the Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee, and it has to go through the uh, Senate Ways and Means Committee, and then the Senate Rules Committee, and then to the Senate floor. Um, I I don't serve on health and long-term care, so I'm I'm not sure what will happen there. I do serve on Ways and Means, and will do my best to advocate uh, for it in that uh, in that spot. But that is going to be one of the uh, tough issues that's in front of the Senate here in these last three weeks of the session. Well, uh, building on that, um, Nicole and I definitely voted for 1868. I mean, under the basic theme of give nurses a break, for God's sake. I mean, it was really simple to us, uh, to, particularly in light of the pandemic. In addition, uh, myself and Nicole have spent a lot of time in terms of uh, improving the workforce, that is increasing the workforce in healthcare and in behavioral health in particular. Uh, one of the things we did a few years ago, which uh, has made a difference, believe it or not, is that uh, we uh, created a community health college for Seattle Central College and put it in the Pacific Tower building, the north end of uh, Beacon Hill there. And uh, that's a great effort. They're, they're graduating nurses, uh, dental technicians, and a whole bunch of others in the healthcare, allied healthcare field. So we have to increase the supply, but we also got to treat the nurses with a lot more respect and help in terms of doing their jobs. Yep, I'll say, yeah, both and. Um, we can um, continue to encourage, um, you know, to increase the capacity of teaching nurses, graduating nurses, but we're hearing more and more they don't want to go to these settings where the work conditions are completely untenable. So 1868, I think, is, is, a, is a key 
piece of the strategy. And as Frank said, in addition to the things we've already done, um, we did engage all of the four-year institutions and the community colleges to give us information about the number of slots um, for nursing students that they can increase um, if they had additional uh, state resource to create that capacity for new cohorts of students to come through. Um, part One of the biggest challenges um, in creating more um, slots for nursing students has been that nursing educators um, it's a very difficult position to recruit for because um, often people can just earn more money if they're working out in the healthcare field rather than in the higher ed field. So um, we've also been looking at um, how we do some dedicated um, loan repayment um, specifically for nurse educators to attract them um, and, and sort of uh, widen the pipeline of um, education uh, for healthcare folks. Yeah, along those lines, we passed in 2019 the Workforce Education Investment Act, which provides funding for those very things. Uh, we literally paid the salaries of nursing faculty at the Seattle Centro and other community colleges so they'd stay uh, there in the classroom teaching the next generation of nurses. In addition, uh, Nicole mentioned that uh, about uh, student loans for nurses, we're also passing a bill to provide public financing of, of uh, student loans so that it's not subject to all the high interest rates that the private sector has done over the many years. Uh, and we also uh, had other investments out of the workforce education investment, uh, including free college and university tuition for all low income students, a big proportion of which go into healthcare. All right, thank you everybody. And we are just about five minutes away from the end of our hour here. Um, before we wrap up, I see Joe is watching on YouTube and he really wants us to get to his question before we end. So let's go ahead and do that. He's asking us about House Bill 1329. This is a bill related to um, encouraging uh, public access for um, uh, open meetings and public meetings. It passed the House and it's now in the Senate. Senator Peterson, can you tell us about um, what you know about that bill getting through the Senate? Uh, so that's a bill that was introduced last year. Uh, it passed last year out of the Senate gov uh, State Government and Elections Committee uh, and then just caught, got caught uh, in the normal rush of House bills at the end of session and didn't, didn't have enough time. Um, this year, uh, I, I, let me back up and just explain to folks that I think part of the reason for the question is uh, my role this year is I'm the Senate Majority Floor Leader, so I am the one who sets the order of consideration for bills on the Senate floor. Um, I don't just do that in a vacuum. Uh, what happens is that our chairs give us their highest priorities out of committee, uh, and so we try as hard as we can to get to all of the bills that are high priorities for the chairs of the different committees. Um, then uh, we also have this thing called the majority rule in the Senate. So we have to have 25 votes to bring something to the floor. It doesn't seem like that's likely to be a problem on this uh, on this bill. So as long as there's not some uh, flag that Senator Hunt as chair of the committee has about the bill, I think we will do our best to um, to get through it. And uh, in the first half of session, we, we reached all of our priorities and uh, a number of sort of medium priority bills. So uh, I'm, I will do my best to uh, see if we can get that one through. Well, Senator, you answered that so quickly that we're gonna squeeze in one more. Uh, Representative Chop and Representative Macri, do you have any thoughts about um, the prospect of the high capacity um, magazines for guns bill getting to um, the house floor and to the governor's desk? And then we'll turn to closing remarks. Well, we definitely support that bill. We appreciate Jamie's uh, incredible work to get it out of the Senate. And so we will work together in the House to advance it and hopefully pass the floor uh, in the House. Uh, then the governor, I'm sure, will sign it uh, very quickly in terms of that's one of his priorities over the time. So we'll, we'll do what we can here to get it out of the House as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're now just a couple minutes from the end of our time here. So let's go to some closing remarks. Can you tell us um, any last thoughts you want to share with your constituents before we end for today? I'm glad to start off. I just, um, as usual, totally impressed and grateful for the detailed questions from the constituents of the 43rd Legislative District. 
Um, I always say this is sort of, um, you know, a high performing group of constituents in the sense that folks really, really understand the complexities um, of these policy issues and have been great um, advisors to us as we sort of suss through the complexities of these issues. So um, continue, please, to reach out to us um, as we as we continue to work um, on issues this this session. Um, we are, you know, we are, as you heard, um, dealing with a lot of complex issue around climate action, around housing policy, around um, police accountability, and and um, you know, these are issues as as always when we're working on these policy issues at the state level that have huge impacts to folks in our districts, in our district as well as people across the state. Um, I do think, as I mentioned, started off today. Um, we'll see a uh, movement on all three budgets, supplemental budgets, the capital budget, the transportation budget, including the transportation package that we mentioned, um, and the operating budget. So your um, feedback um, as, as those um, packages um, move through the process will be very important. We only have about two and a half weeks left until the end of session, so it will be fast and furious, um, so to speak, as, as we... Um, continue to, to work through the policy that the, the other chamber passed over, um, and as we also um, continue on the budget. These supplemental budgets um, are of a magnitude that I think have never, never been seen before in a second year of a biennium, um, and so um, the work is relatively intense, um, but the needs are very large as we continue to navigate our way through the pandemic. Frank, you want to go next? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I do want to put in a word for uh, somebody who made a critical difference in, in order for us to have additional funds to do a lot of good things, and that's Stacey Abrams in Georgia. There were two Democratic senators who got elected there to get to 50, which then triggered a variety of things like the American uh, Rescue Plan and, and other investments at the federal level. That may not happen again. I'm pretty sure it won't based on the politics right now. So we have to do great things now, but also prepare for the future. And there's still great unmet needs in this society in Washington state. Uh, when I hear the uh, stories about the uh, need for special education funding in our public schools, or the folks who've got de developmental disabilities, they are way underfunded in terms of what we need to do. And so we need to link the great need that we have in parts of our Washington society with a the revenue source that can then lead us to fund those things. And so we'll be working not only this session, but during the interim to prepare our next session uh, to do additional things that are high priorities for the people's needs of this state. But we got to do it in a way that makes our system, uh, not just our tax system, but our entire society more fair and equitable for everyone. So I thank everybody for being here today and uh, look forward to further comments from you as I, I'm sure you'll contact our offices. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm just going to close uh, with maybe a slightly different take. I, I think one of the things that I appreciate about serving in the Senate, and it's been great to be mostly back in person on the floor this year, is the opportunity for us to model civil discourse and uh, collaboration in trying to solve these problems. You know, the problems that we have um, with homelessness or uh, with behavioral health issues or with special education or with transportation are not democratic problems and they're not Republican problems. And all sorts of people, even with very different political beliefs, um, want to solve the problems for their communities. And the legislature is really a, a wonderful and unique place for people to come together and try to work collaboratively on finding solutions to those problems. So. Uh, it is my hope that in our work in committees, in our work uh, on the floor, and in our interactions with all of you, we can continue to model civil discourse and show sort of a, a different way from the, um, you know, kind of sniping and very partisan uh, work that we sometimes see at other levels of government. The state, the state government is uh, in better position in that way. And that wraps up our time today, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.